It's a pleasure to have uh, the speaker today, Tanya Hinder from uh, the University of Maryland. Tanya did a PhD at Cornell University with Ella Flanagan before moving to Caltech for a few years. Has not been at Maryland since uh, 2011. Yeah. yeah. Working with Alexander Bonano. And uh, today she's going to tell us about a gravitational wave modeling for comparable mass system. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. And um, please feel free at any time to interrupt and ask questions. Um, we can also shorten the talk if there are many questions on intermediate things that I'm going to say. So um, the talk is about gravitational waves. And probably recently you've heard a lot about the gravitational waves from inflation, which um, have been most likely observed um, in the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. But those are not the waves I'll talk about here. Um, I will talk about um, waves produced by astrophysical objects that are accelerating. So, so one possible mechanism would be a binary in, an, in orbit around one another. And that will generate a time-varying quadrupole. Um, so there's a time-changing gravitational field, which produces gravitational waves that we can hope to detect on Earth. So these binaries are key sources for a gravitational wave detector on Earth. But um, to detect and interpret the signals, we need to have some accurate theoretical models because these signals are very weak and buried deep in the noise. So special match, match filtering techniques are needed to dig them out. And I'll tell you about some of the um, approaches to modeling these in spirals, the tools we have and um, what can be done. And then I'll focus in particular on um, how we can model spin effects in black hole binaries, and in particular in a so-called effective one-body approach. And I'll explain a bit what that is. It's similar to the motion of a reduced mass in Newtonian gravity. And then if th there's time, I'll talk a little bit about finite size effects that are important for neutron star binaries. So um, just to remind you about um, the existing network of gravitational wave detectors, there are four different sites, um, LIGO in Hanford and Livingston in the USA, and then Virgo in Italy and HFGO 600 in Germany, which is kind of a smaller detector. So those have four kilometer long arm length and are essentially Michelson type interferometers that try to monitor relative changes in the arms that would happen if the gravitational wave passed. And these are extremely sensitive instruments. They can de detect displacements of 10 to the minus 18 meters relative between um, two points on the arms. And um, they've been built already in the 1990s and have completed some initial searches, but they weren't very sensitive. So they didn't really expect to detect any gravitational waves. But currently, um, a major hardware upgrade is in progress to make them 10 times more sensitive. And that is almost completed. And for these gravitational waves, the thing is you detect an directly an amplitude. You don't have a flux. So a 10 times um, improvement in sensitivity means a thousand times improvement in the volume that is visible to the detector. So you see here, just as an illustration to give you a, a si uh, so, some idea of what the improvement means is this was the region of the universe visible to the initial detectors, which didn't see anything, and then a thousand times larger volume for the advanced detectors. So we are really hoping that um, in this large volume, with these millions of galaxies, there will be some um, that contain merging compact objects, for example, or some other sources. So the timeline for that is um, that in early 2015, advanced LIGO should be ready and um, should start a first science run. They won't be at um, design sensitivity yet, but they'll gradually improve their sensitivity. And by about 2019, they should um, reach the design sensitivity. And around that time also, there are two detectors planned, um, one in Japan and one in India, which will um, give also a better sky coverage so that the sources can be localized 
um, better. And then there are some future detectors. There's an ELISA, which will be a spacecraft um, scheduled for 2034, which is still a while away, but a Pathfinder mission might already um, be launched in a few years. And then there's what's called the Einstein telescope, which would be a more sensitive LIGO detector, essentially also ground-based. So um, there's a lot to come. And one of the key sources for these detectors are the coalescing binaries that I mentioned before. So we don't know exactly how many are expected to be observed because there are large uncertainties in binary formation and evolution. So, so the idea will be that um, LIGO would measure a rate and then constrain the models of the binary evolution. So, but roughly just extrapolating from the pulsars we see in our galaxy, um, one, can, one can say a lower limit on the event rate is about 0 0.4 events per year. Um, and a higher limit, an upper limit, is only given by the fact that initial LIGO didn't see anything. So it could still be hundreds to thousands per year. We don't know yet because we, we at the moment, cannot see them. And the waveform from these binaries um, has a char characteristic form that is shown here. So you see the gravitational waveform versus time. And it oscillates, and then it chirps up in amplitude and frequency towards the end. And so it, it consists roughly of an adiabatic in spiral, where the two objects orbit one another, um, lose energy and angular momentum to gravitational waves, so the orbit shrinks because of these losses. So as, and as they get closer, the frequency increases. Finally, at some point, the orbit will become unstable, and the two objects will collide and form a single highly perturbed black hole that then sheds its perturbation and rings down, as is um, seen here, this decaying oscillations. And the precise shape of these chirp oscillations tells you a lot about the parameters in the system. For example, for equal masses, the chirp looks rather symmetric. For unequal masses, mass ratio 1 to 6, you see it looks a bit asymmetric. And when there are spins, there could be some modulations from precession, for example. So um, these signals, they are very weak, as, as um, is already indicated by the fact that so much work has to go into making these highly sensitive detectors. And for most of these signals, the amplitude of the actual gravitation waveform will be um, much less than the amplitude of the noise in the detectors. So one has to use a special technique to, fil to filter out the, the, these signals from the noise, and also to, at the same time, um, measure the parameters of the signal to know what it was, what the source was that caused the signal. And the idea is to, to have a bank of theoretical waveform templates that depend on um, all kinds of different parameters. So, so it's a parameterized bank of waveforms. And then the data stream is passed through this bank and um, convolved with it so that um, at some point, if there is a signal present in the data, when you convolve it with this bank of waveform templates with varying parameters, at some point for some choice of parameters, there might be a peak in the signal to noise ratio. And that would tell you that there was a signal present in the data, and it would also the, um, tell you which parameters it had, because the best fit parameters of the template will be those that characterize the signal. But for this method to be successful, one needs templates that have a fractional phasing accuracy over the entire tens of thousands of cycles of the in-spiral, and also they have to cover the entire physical parameter space. And computing those templates is um, quite a challenge, um, because one has to, to, in principle, solve for the dy dynamical space-time characterizing the binary. So in Newtonian gravity, one would simply solve for the gravitational potential, and its source would just be the mass density. But in relativity, of course, it's much more complicated. It's not just a Poisson's equation. One has a highly nonlinear differential operator that acts on six different fields, G alpha, beta. And then one has a nonlinear source that consists of density, pressure, 
momentum flow and so on. So it, it gives um, a very complicated system of equations that has to, has to be solved. And also the equations of motion are fairly simple in Newtonian gravity, but they're very complicated in relativity. So to tackle this problem, we have different um, tools available to us, and um, those are illustrated here for the parameter space of binaries in terms of their orbital separation on the, the y-axis and their mass ratio on the x-axis. So for binaries at large orbital separation where the gravitational field is weak, one can use post-Newtonian theory, which is essentially perturbations on top of Newtonian dynamics, gradually including more and more relativistic effects. And this is very successful for describing, for example, the solar system or binary pulsars, but it um, breaks down in the strong field regime at small orbital separation. A method to it that also has access to the strong field regime um, are black hole perturbations, which are valid in, for extreme mass ratio systems. And they're perturbations on top of the test particle limit. And they, they give full access to relativistic effects in that regime. And of course, as you know very well from the group here, um, there is numerical relativity. I've maybe exaggerated a bit um, where it's confined to in terms of the parameter space, but essentially it can um, do um, any, any um, type of relativistic effect for fairly comparable masses. And the reason, of course, you might say, wh why, if we have numerical relativity, do we still need these perturbative approaches? Why not just um, solve everything on the computer? And that, that's simply computationally impossible. So you, you can see it already here for, if you consider the time scales in the problem for the binary. So as you go, for example, if you try to extend the numerical relativity to larger orbital separation, you would find that, first of all, orbits would take longer to complete an orbit, and also the in spiral would be much longer. So at some point, the computational cost gets just too prohibitive. And similarly, if you try to extend to very large mass ratios, um, again, your in spiral would take very long. In, in real time, it takes maybe up to a year or so. And also, one has to resolve both the small mass and the large mass, so that is also computationally very difficult. Now, by the way, you can correct me if I'm misstating something here. But um, for these LIGO detectors, or the Earth-based gravitational interferometers, um, they, they will only have access to mass ratios that are not too extreme, so less than 1,000 maybe. And an individual binary in, with, within the detector sensitive band will start at larger orbital separation and then evolve to very small separations until they collide. So we need models that cover the entire path to merger for these binaries. So now the question is, what do we do to bridge this gap between the post-Newtonian and the numerical relativity? And one approach that um, has received a lot of effort is um, what is called an effective one-body model. And its goal is simply to um, make complete waveforms for LIGO searches. It doesn't in aspire to um, be a complete solution of the Einstein equations or anything. It's just a phenomenological model to, um, to be useful for LIGO searches. And the idea is that um, one takes information from both perturbative areas, one has the post-Newtonian regime for any mass ratio, and then one has the test particle limit that gives access to relativistic effects. And then one also takes some input from numerical relativity simulations at the end. And one uses that to map the binary problem onto a much simpler effective problem, which is supposed to be similar to what you do in Newtonian physics when you have a two-body problem you go to the center of mass, and you have the motion of the total mass, which is usually zero, and then the reduced mass moves around the space-time of the total mass. So let me explain in a bit more detail um, how this works now for relativistic binaries. 
And for, for the moment, let's say it's a non-spinning problem. So one has the two bodies, and you can define a total mass and the reduced mass mu, and then a symmetric metric mass ratio that I denote by eta here. And in post-Newtonian theory, one can do perturbations, 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 and crank out what the Hamiltonian is that describes this two-body system, just up to some order where your perturbation expansion um, has been calculated. So here I just show the first post-Newtonian order. So you have here the Newtonian Hamiltonian, and then a post-Newtonian correction. And you see it looks pretty ugly. So now the idea is, instead of dealing with this, where we know already these higher order terms, I, we can keep adding and adding, but it's never going to converge and give a good solution. Instead, let's do something different and consider um, something analogous to the motion of the reduced mass in some background space time. And um, we know that f from the test particle limit, the background space time should be that of a non rotating black hole or a Schwarzschild like space time. And it, the metric has just this simple form. There are some metric potentials that are denoted by A and B here. And then here is just the angular spherically symmetric part. And now the idea is okay, in the test particle limit, we know what these potentials are. But we now want to describe comparable mass systems. So we just add some term that looks like a post Newtonian expansion um, and just have some undetermined coefficient in front of that term. So the requirement on this coefficient is just that it has to vanish in the test particle limit so that we completely recover the Schwarzschild solution. OK, so, th so then given this metric, one can write down what the Hamiltonian is that describes the motion of this effective mass. So again, it just depends on these um, metric potentials A and B. OK, but now how do we relate now this real two-body system to this effective reduced mass-like system? Well, in relativity, there are many uh, difficulties with uh, relating coordinates and so on. So one has to find some invariance that one can really be sure can be um, identified between the two systems. And in particular, what is used here is the radial action variable. So in the two-body case, um, that is a function of the total energy and um, the azimuthal angular momentum. And for this reduced problem, similarly, but now it depends on, depends on the effective energy and, again, the azimuthal angular momentum. So now, when you require that these two actions, or the phase space areas, in some sense, are equal, then you can determine how your effective Hamiltonian is related to the energy of the real system. So that gives you, immediately, in this model, you have to um, replace the two-body Hamiltonian um, with this effective Hamiltonian. It has to have this kind of structure. Okay, so that's already um, a lot of progress. We know how to relate the energies. Now we still have to determine these um, metric potentials that entered into this effective metric. So then one can just post-Newtonian expand this um, EOB Hamiltonian and compare to this um, ugly looking post-Newtonian Hamiltonian. And what one finds then is that at the same order as I wrote down this post-Newtonian Hamiltonian, you just have an effective Hamiltonian that looks like this. It's very simple. There is no correction at that order, and here is also one. So you see it really simplifies your life. And that is especially true also at higher orders when these post-Newtonian expressions, they can take up pages and pages of just equations, whereas the EOB Hamiltonian just picks up a few more terms in, in these metric potentials. So now how, how do we include spins? Well, it's kind of this similar idea. Um, instead of taking a Schwarzschild-like metric that describes a non-rotating black hole, we take a Kerr metric um, for, to include the black hole spin. And we take the metric parameters, instead of the Kerr mass and Kerr spin, we take to be the total mass of the binary and the total spin of the binary. 
And then again, you have this identification from the action variables that you always have. It, it's not going to change when we add um, other ingredients. And for the effective Hamiltonian, you have to compute that for a spinning particle in Kerr. So this has al already been done. It doesn't look too pretty, but um, it's, it's now with that in hand, one can um, post-Newtonian expand this expression and compare to the post-Newtonian Hamiltonian for the spins. Yes? So, um, so the, the spin in the background space does not include orbital angular momentum? No. Um, there are, there's a lot of freedom in doing this mapping. So you could um, probably, I, I would say there's enough freedom that you could um, find this orbital angular momentum parameterization. But um, in the model here, it um, was chosen to be just the two spins. Um. So, so then when, when you um, compute what the, this effective spin is, then you find that actually this picture is no longer quite so accurate because the effective spin in the test particle limit, it's the spin of the small object, but um, in general, it's just some function of the, the canonical spins, S1 and S2, and also depends on the momenta and coordinates. So it's just a way that tells you how to restructure all the post-Newtonian terms into some effective spin variable. But it, it doesn't satisfy any Lie brackets or anything. The canonical spins are S1 and S2 that have the canonical angular momentum brackets. OK. So how accurate is this model? Before we even go to the gravitational waves, we have to know how, how good is the dynamics represented. And one way to do this is by um, looking at gauge invariant quantities that can be computed both in numerical relativity and um, from this effective one body model. So one particular quantity is the periastron advance, which is very well known in the case of Mercury, where um, Mercury has an elliptical orbit and the ellipse processes by some angle, um, a few arc seconds per century after subtracting off all kinds of perturbations. So um, generally for a Newtonian two-body system, the ellipse would just be the same forever. But when there are perturbations, they could be from the spin of the small object, from third bodies, from a quadrupole moment of the sun, if, if, if it's large enough, then that will cause the ellipse to process. And um, the amount of precession can be calculated. And um, this, this kind of effect is what we wanted to compare, but for black holes now, not for Mercury and the sun. And this was possible because Abdul here and um, the collaborators, they um, managed to compute um, the periastron precession for black holes for, um, from numerical relativity. And he spent a lot of time getting it very accurately, as you can see in this figure here. But before I get to that, let me show, tell you, so for, for the effective one body model, you can very easily compute the periastron advance as the ratio of the um, orbital frequency to the radial frequency. We are working in the limit of almost circular orbits. You just have to take some partial derivatives of the Hamiltonian. So that's very well defined and fairly straightforward to compute. And then we can compare the results um, from the effective one body to the numerical relativity. And this is shown here. So here you see essentially this um, phase change plus one on the y-axis. You notice it's, it can get quite large um, for the, the black holes. And then here is just as a function of the orbital frequency. So this is for equal masses, almost extremal spins, 0 0.97. So the, the most a black hole could have would be spin of one. And um, so here, the solid blue is the numerical relativity result. Um, the dashed blue are the error bars from the numerical simulation, which get very small, especially early on. And then the red is the EOB model. So you see it is consistent within the error bars for this case um, over this entire frequency range. 
And then just for comparison, if you just took the post-Newtonian result, it would be outside the error bar. So it, it clearly shows that the effective one-body way of rewriting the post-Newtonian results is, um, at least in this case, um, works fairly well. So it, over the entire parameter space that we could compare, um, there are a few cases that didn't work quite so well. That was mainly for the anti-aligned spins. Um, yeah, um, mainly for the anti-aligned spins, but the results were still fairly consistent. So here you're looking again at this periastron advance as a function of the spin parameter now. And the blue is the numerical relativity, the red is again the EOB, and the black is just a normal post-Newtonian. You see um, here is the blow up of the aligned spins. Um, it, the agreement is very good, but as you go to anti-aligned, it gets a bit worse, but not worrisome worse. Do you have any intuition for why it gets worse for anti-aligned? Um, yes, so we discussed this a bit. Probably um, these anti-aligned spins are more relativistic in the sense that they are closer to um, the unstable orbit. So if you think of um, a, a particle in Kerr, um, if for anti-aligned spin, the ISCO is at 9m or so out, far out, whereas for aligned spins, it's at 1m. And if you fix yourself to some specific frequency, you're closer to the ISCO for anti-aligned than you are for aligned. So that, that is a hand-waving way. I don't know if it's entirely correct, but it's an argument I, I can give as an answer. So, um, and for varying the mass ratio, so Abdul had simulations mass ratio one to eight, um, you can see again the EUB model works fairly well, whereas the post-Newtonian starts to become worse and worse. So now um, we know that the dynamics are at least fairly well represented in this model, at least over the parameters we could test. So now how do you actually get an in spiral and a waveform out of this? So for the, for the um, in-spiral part, it's fairly straightforward. Instead of just having the conservative Hamiltonian equations, you add the radiation reaction force that comes from the back reaction of the gravitational wave emission. And then to improve things, you add um, some parameterized higher order post-Newtonian terms to the potentials where you fix the coefficients by comparing with numerical relativity results. So this would just be important very much towards the end when the binary becomes relativistic. And you can do other tricks. You can, for example, instead of writing things as Taylor series expansions, you write it as exponentials or uh, logarithms, anything. You're just constrained by the fact that you have to reproduce the post-Newtonian when you post-Newtonian expand and you have to reduce to the test particle limit. So there is still a lot of freedom of what you can do. And um, yeah, as I said, these resummed or factorized waveforms are obtained by um, rewriting the post-Newtonian Taylor expansion in terms of more sophisticated functions and products of functions um, that just reproduce the Taylor results. Okay, so that gives you the in-spiral. What do you do when the in spiral ends now? So um, first, at some point, the orbit will become unstable. So the two objects start to plunge together. It's may maybe not so pronounced for equal mass systems. But in any case, you just adi adiabatically continue the in spiral waveform until also the plunge ends. And to, to know what to do then, um, you look, for example, at the frequency. During the in spiral, the frequency slowly increases with time. Um, the plunge is just the adiabatic continuation of the in spiral. And then you hit, hit the point which corresponds for a particle in Schwarzschild corresponds to the light ring, so the, the unstable circular photon orbit, which is this line here. So, okay, so you've evolved now up to there. And you know that at the very end, you have to, um, the, your system becomes a perturbed black hole, which has some quasi-normal modes that ring at a certain frequency. So here, you know at the final end, end point, um, your frequency will be up here. So 
in between, the easiest thing to do is just to smoothly connect these two ends. And this is what is done by adding um, what, is, what they call the superposition of some quasi-normal modes. It's just to make a smooth transition from the end of the plunge to the quasi-normal mode. OK, and for, for spinning um, particles, you can improve these waveforms even further by computing spin effects to higher order in the post-Newtonian fluxes and then incorporating them in the effective one-body model and then comparing with the numerical relativity simulations to, to see how well your model does. And so the numerical relativity group has produced at least um, 38 non-processing waveforms that we compared to and we found that the model worked extremely well. Um, the computations of higher order post-Newtonian terms allowed us to um, eliminate some, some of the free parameters that the model is calibrated to. So um, hopefully it becomes more robust over the parameter space. And so here you just see an example for equal masses and almost extremely spins. So it's hard to, by eye to distinguish them. And even when you compute the overlaps, you find that they are very high. And using these EOB waveforms would lead to a negligible loss in um, the detection rate for advanced LIGO, at least in that part of the parameter space. OK, so, th so this was for non-processing spins. So it includes the secular effects from spins, but doesn't include the precession. But the precession is just basically on top of these secular effects is just some geometric transformations between a processing frame and a non-processing frame. So actually these results can be used to then generate um, the processing waveforms also. So um, for, for black holes, this then concludes all the parameter space that has to be mapped except, of course, extending to higher mass ratios. But black holes are very simple. They just have mass and spin. They don't have anything else. So, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> the orbital parameters, of course, yes. That, that is, um, yeah. It, then let's say in terms of the multipole moments, maybe. OK. Um, yeah, may maybe I'll talk a little bit about now moving on to um, neutron stars, where f for the purpose of the gravitational waves, the finite size effects will become important. So as you probably know better than me, um, the neutron stars are the strongest gravitational wave, uh, gravitational environment where matter can stably exist. Um, if you compress the matter even a bit more, it would collapse to a black hole. Um, we have observed more than thousands of them, mainly in our galaxy. Um, they have masses between one and some unknown upper mass, um, but roughly no more than three solar masses. Radii are fairly uncertain, um, 9 to 14 kilometers. And the matter in the center is compressed to up to 10 times nuclear density. So here is an illustration of um, the structure of a neutron star. So it, it has a thin outer atmosphere and um, envelope. And then there's a crust of um, essentially a lattice of ions. Um, then at some point, as, as um, the density gets even higher, it becomes more favorable to have free neutrons um, coming out of the, the lattice. And at some point, the material will be just kind of a soup of free neutrons. Um, they, they are superconducting, and there are some protons mixed in that are, um, no, the neutrons are superfluid and the protons are superconducting. But then if you compress even more, um, you would just from energetics, you would expect that new particles appear, hyperons, or you might even, if you compress to 10 times nuclear density, you have maybe some free quarks or some Bose-Einstein condensate of quarks. No one really knows because it's just too, far, too much of an extrapolation from what we currently know. So, so one of the key questions really in physics is um, what is the nature of matter in such conditions? And for neutron stars, um, that they probe an, an important part of the QCD phase diagram. So here you just see, roughly speaking, you see um, the phase diagram 
as uh, one, one version of the phase diagram mm -hmm. um, for temperature versus baryon density. And um, for example, at high temperature, you have the quark gluon plasma, but at some point there must be a phase transition to the solid phase, which are the hadrons. And then you have nuclei here. Um, then at very high baryon density, you might have some what, what particle physicists might call su color superconductivity, some strange phase of quark matter. And neutron stars probe this entire range here at almost zero temperature, um, where here is the, the crust part, and then at higher densities um, is the core part. And that's very complementary to um, what, what um, collider experiments probe, which are always in the kinetic energy dominated regime, whereas for the neutron stars, it's more the interactions between the particles is important. So this is um, one of the reasons we're very much looking forward to gravitational wave measurements, because if you try to infer something from astrophysics about these neutron stars, you will always see the emission coming from the surface and traveling through the interstellar medium. So it's very hard to then extrapolate backwards to what the matter is doing in the neutron star cores. But with gravitational waves, you don't have that contamination. You um, are sensitive to directly what is going on in the core. So for these neutron stars, as I might have mentioned before, um, one expects to see about 0.4 to 400 per year. And for neutron star black holes, it's probably similar, the rate. Now, when there are neutron stars in the binary, the chirp gets modified in two ways. So first, at merger, um, the wave looks very different. So for example, for neutron star black holes, if there is tidal disruption, um, the waveform doesn't have a ring down. Then for two neutron stars, there are many different outcomes. It could form a hypermassive neutron star, which then collapses or could collapse immediately. And that gives rise to many different features in these merger waveforms. But also, there's another effect that comes during the in-spiral. And that is a small effect, but it accumulates over the tens of thousands of cycles. And um, that gives rise to, depending on the neutron star equation of state, um, the phase evolution is slightly different. And that dephasing is char characterized by a single parameter, which is called the tidal deformability. And this is very nice, because for the matched filtering, you, you don't want to add a zillion parameters to parameterize the neutron star, because otherwise you, you don't know what um, exactly it is you're measuring. If you can just measure a single parameter, that's much more robust than the prediction. So what is this tidal deformability? So let me tell you um, how we try to model this. So of course, if you have a neutron star in isolation, it would be pretty much spherical. So let's say it's not spinning for the moment. Spin we can add later on. But when you place it in a binary system, then it feels the tidal field from the companion because it's, it has some finite size. So in response to this tidal field, it will deform and develop a quadrupole moment. And um, to, to linear order, the response of this induced quadrupole moment is linearly proportional to the amount of tidal field that it felt. And this proportionality constant is what the tidal deformability is defined to be. So to, to describe such a situation now, uh, we do the following. So we take a region around the neutron star, which is maybe not showing up in this um, display, but um, we basically say around the neutron star, there's a region where we use full general relativity. And we don't make any weak field approximation because neutron stars are intrinsically relativistic objects. So we should not make any weak field approximation for them. But then for the orbit, if the binary is far apart, we can do post-Newtonian expansions. And we can even then resum it as the effective one body resummation. So then in the frame of the neutron star, if we consider it in its own asymptotic rest frame, these quantities, quadrupole and tidal field, um, show up as coefficients in its asymptotic gravitational potential. So the quadrupole falls off as one of the, the distance from the star cubed. 
and the tidal field is growing in that um, setup. And that defines what, what these quantities are that enter the tidal deformability relation. So, so then we can co actually compute this constant by um, doing linear perturbations of a relativistic star. And it turns out that once you do everything go through the perturbation of the metric and the pressure and density of the star, you find that all you have to do to, to get this tidal deformability is to solve a differential equation inside the neutron star. You have to do it numerically. Um, and then get the value of um, this h, which is the perturbation to GTT um, at the surface. And then that allows you, by matching to the exterior solution, where you know what the asymptotic fall off is and how this lambda enters into the quantities, you, you get um, an explicit expression. Once you know this y from the integration of um, the interior, you get um, the tidal deformability. And it scales like the neutron star radius to the fifth power. So just to show you a few results for, for how this looks, um, here you see the parameter in some units as a function of mass. And for these curves are all different equations of state. So you can see it spans quite a range of um, values. So the hope is that gravitational wave measurements will constrain these values or even measure them. And also, this tidal parameter, somewhat unfortunately, but uh, it makes sense, is not sensitive to any um, details of the interior composition. It's more the global distribution of the mass that it, it is sensitive to. So how, how does this parameter enter into the waveform? Well, there are two kinds of effects. First, for the conservative part, some energy will be required to deform the stars. So there is a correction to the energy of the system, which is the Newtonian orbital energy, post-Newtonian corrections, and a term that depends on the tidal deformability. Second, then um, the quadrupole from the star is now phase coherent with the orbital quadrupole. So there's an enhanced emission of gravitational radiation. And again, this is proportional to the tidal deformability. So you can then, um, once you have the energy and the energy loss, you can um, assume um, flux balance and then integrate the um, equation of motion obtained by equating the, the loss of energy of the orbit to the flux of gravitational waves at infinity um, to get the phase evolution. So um, there are, of course, we've made a number of approximations for this model. For example, we didn't consider higher multipoles, some nonlinear effects, um, also some adiabatic approximations. But we can um, redo the calculation, including all these effects, at least to leading order, and estimate their magnitude. And we find most of them are fairly small. Um, the dominant are um, higher order corrections to tidal interactions, which can be calculated. And then there's um, sort of a tail of an F-mode resonance from the neutron star that could also start to um, become important. The mode never becomes resonant during the in-spiral, but it kind of has, has a long tail, which could give an effect. So um, to see how well the um, analytical models perform, and if we're really getting the right physics of the tidal effects, one again has to compare to numerical relativity simulations. But now the problem is that many of the simulations don't have um, good error estimates, first of all, and if they do, um, the errors are still fairly large. So here at, at the moment, from what is available in the literature, the results are inconclusive. So here you see, for example, um, the shaded region is the numerical error, and the dashed regions, except for the black, are different models of tidal effects. So they're pretty much all consistent with the data, so one cannot favor one model over another. Similarly, um, yeah, here this shows a different paper with kind of the same result. The red curve would be um, the numerical error, and the pink curve would be the tidal effect. So it's uh, definitely an area where further work is needed. Um, 
So I think it's just gamma equals two polytropes, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, so it's it looks basically um, so like like these normal matter equations. It looks fair, pretty much like that, depending on for polytropes what radius you choose. So they can mimic any any tidal deformability that would be predicted by um, more microphysically motivated equations of state. Okay, so that brings me to the summary. Um, so in the next few years, there should be some nice um, news about observations of gravitational waves from these interferometer detectors. And there is a lot of science potential to be done, especially with coalescing binaries. But to extract all the science from the data, we have to have accurate theoretical waveform templates. And um, there has been much re recent progress on including more physics, for, such as uh, spins and finite size effects. And currently, uh, one of the main things we at Maryland are working on is um, the neutron star black hole case with the tidal disruption, because they can get very small errors. So it's a cleaner system also to study than the double neutron stars, where there's matter effects bo from both bodies. And there's, of course, a lot of work to be done with improving the models, extending the parameter space. So thank you. Do the rotation of the Newton stars change all the tidal interactions? Um, to leading order, no. They're dis disconnected. So one would just add the rotational um, uh, rotationally induced quadrupole to the other one. But for the rotational quadrupole, it's, it scales like the spin squared. So it's very small compared to the tidal quadrupole. Uh, should I call on people? Okay. You just had a function. So, yeah, nice yeah, function, yeah. Like that function is a long expression of terms, and um, there are a lot of terms you could add in addition um, because of all the gauge transformation freedom of how you map between the real problem and this effective spin problem. So there's no clear phase space action variable mapping like you have in the original ELB to guide you? No, that is still done. Um, so this action variable mapping is done to get to relate the effective energy to the real energy. And then the rest is just obtained by post-Newtonian expanding both sides. So, so this mapping is always there. It's just um, the model fixes itself to, to just have this mapping give you this HEOB as a function of H effective. And you keep that for all times. And then on top of that, you have the post expansion. So is the spin mapping determined by that expansion? Yeah. Yeah. And there are different ways. The group in Paris, Damour, and so on, they have different ways of incorporating the spin. They choose a different dis um, gauge, essentially because you can cancel out some post-Newtonian terms if you make a good choice of these variables. So. Yeah, that's one of, and also how you distribute the spin between the particle and the black hole. That's another uh, way one can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you are doing uh, neutron stars instead of black holes, mm -hmm. are there any new DOB terms that need to be calibrated to an R, or are those all set by PN and the other calibration? No, there, there will probably be um, new terms to parameterize the tidal effects. Because analytically, in the post Newtonian, we can only calculate up to a certain order. 
and then we we are currently doing the comparison to see if those terms are if higher order terms are necessary or if the tidal terms can be resummed in some um, efficient way. So um, there might might also need to be a lot of terms to parameterize the tidal disruption when it happens and so on. So it, it'll be very interesting and a lot of work. Thank you.